Okay, well, welcome. Uh, my name is Dominic Shattuck, and I'm going to lead us off today and, and get this webinar started. I think we'll pull up some slides, and um, as everyone's kind of tuning in here and, and logging on, we can start through some of the logistics uh, for this webinar. And I, I imagine that many of you are quite expert in Zoom by now, but uh, just in case, I will go through a little bit of the webinar logistics and who the mail engagement uh, task force is. So if you'll go to the next slide, please, Kendra. So as, as you know, since you signed up, uh, today's focus is around parenting and caregiving and males, male engagement and men's role in parenting and caregiving and how this relates to health and, and kind of the, the impact that this can have on a family's health or individual's health within that family. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. So I'm one member of the Male Engagement Task Force. Uh, if my colleagues are here. If they want to put their camera on for a moment, give a wave. Um, those who are here, I know Danette isn't joining us today, but I think most everybody else is. Uh, and so we work through USAID, uh, and we are at, an advocacy arm for the uh, for male engagement across the health sectors, which include HIV, family planning, uh, maternal and child health, immunization, a number of different areas. Uh, and we've been working in this space for a while. Several of us have been on this panel for uh, many years. Um, we've been working with different organizations and convening and advocating for male engagement programming within USAID funded programs. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. So some of the webinar logistics are, you know, we want you to introduce yourself, give us a little bit more information in the chat right now. It's great to, to pull all of those and have a better understanding of who the audience is for today's uh, webinar. We want you to remain on mute. I don't know that you even have the function. I think it may have been, the, the microphone may have been shut off, but even so, let's let's keep it mute while the talkers, the, the, the presenters are sharing their experience uh, and their insights for us today. Um, we do have a Q&A function uh, that we would like you to use that provides an opportunity to ask some questions. Some of those questions may be answered within the text in the Q&A function, or we may hold a question or two for the, for the Q&A session at the end. Uh, for the for the speakers to respond to. Um, and also, we are recording this webinar now. So you I think you did have to opt in opt into the recording component to this. Uh, so you can refer to it later and we will send out that recording to everyone uh, on the listserv. And and that being said, you can then share it forward with individuals who may have other interests uh, in this topic. So uh, please go to the next slide. We're really fortunate today to have interpretation in Spanish and in uh, uh, French. So you can see within the Zoom uh, functions, the bar on the bottom, that you do have an interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and select your interpretation option as French or Spanish. Uh, and, and hopefully this widens our audience and brings more people into this conversation. And I think, if you ask, I guess back to the Q&A function, if you ask your question in French or Spanish on the Q&A function, we'll do our best to kind of respond to that and answer to that, answer those questions um, in your local language and in English as well for everybody else. So if we go to the next question, please, or next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the Mail Engagement Task Force is an information advocacy and knowledge exchange network that explores how to better reach and include men and boys in health promotion. We also uh, take into account issues of gender equality and addressing gender dynamics that act as barriers to health and focus on several health areas, as mentioned before, the family planning, sexual reproductive health, uh, maternal newborn child health, HIV, AIDS, and other infectious diseases. So we also work around, several of us do more research than programs and others do more programs than research. Uh, and so we, we kind of cross that, that bridge and try to integrate new and up and coming research uh, uh, and, and try to provide that programmatic uh, benefit and how those how that research influences programs and vice versa um, through our work. Uh, as you'll see, you so you may have signed up. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Well, before I get into the objectives, also we'll come back to it later. But the um, you know one of the things is Kendra and and our team have been putting together a nice newsletter that provides both programmatic and research, uh, new research that has been coming out in our space uh, and trying to share that across with our 
uh, with, the, with the recipients on the listserv. So something you may want to sign up with uh, for at the end, then we'll share that link with you. Um, today's meeting objectives. Is, so caregiving is a topic that uh, is, is growing and understanding how to increase the male engagement in, in caregiving is something that's been uh, coming up across our, our conversations, within our conversations over the last few months uh, and years and, and finding ways to elevate men's role and engagement in caregiving uh, has been part of some programs supported by USAID and other donors. So we also, today we are trying to initiate this discussion among our community on the role of men as caregivers and develop a shared lexicon. There are some terms and terminology that you're gonna hear today that may be new to you, it was new to me when I started uh, learning a little bit more about this space. Uh, and then you'll also hear and learn from practitioners on the barriers to male caregiving and what working to improve male, uh, men's roles as caregivers looks like. So what is working in this space and how to increase men's engagement in caregiving? Uh, you'll hear some from some of our practitioners from their experience in the, in the field. Uh, and, and third, uh, today we're hoping to facilitate conversations on ways to integrate men's caregiving into programmatic activities and policy efforts in global health. If we go to the next slide, please. So I'm starting us off this morning or this afternoon or evening. Uh, and I'm going to introduce in a moment, I'm going to introduce Tavishi Gupta. Uh, and then we'll have a, for, for a brief overview of the World Fathers Report. And then ba, uh, Ramadan will we'll talk about his organi organization, IIDC, and how it plays a role in coordinating uh, in the East African space. And then we'll have a roundtable discussion where we have three um, panelists who will provide some insights from their work and their experience, uh, both overseeing organizations implementing this work as well as implementing it themselves uh, in their programs. And then we'll wrap it up with some Q&A and a summary. So if you go to the next slide, please. All right, here we go. So let me introduce, if you go to the next slide, Tavishi, Dr. Tavishi Gupta. Uh, Dr. Tavishi Gupta is the Director of Research, Evaluation, and Learning at Equimundo. Her expertise lies in understanding the role of gender norms and perpetuating violence against women and children, creating an equitable home and workplace environments, and reinforcing intergenerational transmission of harmful gender identities for boys and girls. Tavishi has been trained in rigorous mixed methodological research and is widely published. She's part of the Lancet Commission uh, Commission Scientific Advisory Committee on Child Maltreatment and Violence Prevention and the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative Cooperation uh, Embracing uh, Carers Group. Before joining Equimundo, she was an independent consultant with Overseas Development Institute, UNICEF ROSA, Plan International, and Harvard's Kennedy School. She has a BA and MA in psychology from the University of Delhi and a PhD for, in developmental psychology from NYU. Tavishi, if you'd take it away, please. Thank you, Dominic. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank, um, hello, everybody. And today I'm going to be sharing a quick glimpse of our 2023 State of the World's Fathers Report. Um, a huge thank you to everyone um, who has attended, who's at, um, in this webinar. And I wanna shout out my two co-authors who are also in the webinar, Nikki van der Gag and Wessel Vandenberg. Um, the State of the World's Fathers Report is part of our global men care campaign. It is a campaign which is aimed to uh, find ways for men to be allies in supporting women's social and economic equal, uh, equality, in part by taking on more responsibility for childcare and domestic work. So today will be a quick glimpse, and I hope that after the webinar, you are able to dive into the research with some more, uh, into the report with some more excitement. So let me begin by asking you all to imagine a world a world that puts at the heart of political priorities and daily lives the meaning of care. A world where everyone has access to healthcare and education, where men and boys share equally the care burden with women and girls, parental leave for all parents is the norm, and where every household has affordable quality childcare and support in caring for aging family members. That is the world that we hope to achieve. And that is the kind of world where we want to get to with the kind of reports that we put out today. Who did we study? If you can go to the next slide, please, um, Kendra. And the next one. Thank you. Who did we study in this sample? 
We have 17 countries of data that we collected towards the end of 2022 and beginning of 2023 um, with a strong regional representation across the globe, of which out of the 12,000, almost 12,000 participants, we have almost 8,000 parents. Um, we tried our level best to get different kinds of uh, gender identities, but that was proving a little bit challenging in the methodology that we used. Um, that efforts continue to be part of our endeavor as we strongly believe that caregiving applies not just to heteronormative families, but to all kinds of families in the world. Next slide, please. So what did we find? we found that everyone cares about care and they care and they benefit from it. Can you click Kendra so I can, the next piece can come up? Thank you. What we find is nine out of the 10 parents in our sample, they say that caring for children is one of the most enjoyable things in their lives. Clearly from Argentina to Ireland, Austria to Portugal, China, Croatia, Rwanda to India, the research shows that many women and men and people of all gender identities are calling for care to be firmly at the center of their lives. Next slide, please. This is a really cool little kind of word cloud. What we did with our respondents is ask them to take three words and describe what comes to their mind when they think of the word care. The reason why we bring this up here is because what strikes us is that all the words that are used or most of the words that are used in English and in Spanish, the two most utilized languages in our survey, happen to be quite positive in nature. You see words like help, love, uh, caring, you know, protection. And this is very different to the words like burden, which often come up in relation to the word care. Those, the word like burden are can tend to be quite absent from this word cloud. So what this kind of showed to us was that people, the respondents in our sample, view care mostly as a positive thing. Let me kind of nuance this by saying certainly economic hardships, having to take on disproportionate um, amounts of care work will shift that. But as a overall, what we found was that we need to start repositioning the word care and the meaning of caregiving in a positive light. Next slide, please. And this was true when we actually started doing some multivariate analysis as well. What we found that men and women who say that they are satisfied with how involved they are in raising their child are one and a half times more likely to agree that I am the person I always wanted to be and to feel a sense of gratitude. Once again, we see the positive impacts of care in people's lives, and we recognize that this is how we need to start reframing care. Next slide, please. That being said, we do need to pay attention to the diversity in caregiving and start viewing individuals men and women as carers beyond their roles as just mothers and fathers. So in our study, we affirmed that individuals are enmeshed in multiple caregiving responsibilities rather than being isolated individuals responsible only for themselves or just for their child. So just, just some statistics coming your way. 61% of our sample reported doing at least two types of care in any combination. And 24% said they care for an older parent and a child also known as the sandwich generation. 7% of the sample reported that they're doing all four types of care. So partner, child, older parent, and a member with disability. It is therefore not surprising that care is so central in people's lives. It's the bedrock of every single relationship that they have in their day to day. Next slide, please. We also found in our sample, the idea of Ubuntu. I am because you are. What we found is that care is interdependent on each other. And this is true for the men in our sample. So we asked questions on caring for one's own emotional needs, which we know are part of healthy masculinities and positive ways for men to be um, caring individuals. And what we found was that when men say they take care of their emotional selves, they are two to eight times as likely to care for a family member. What this finding suggests is that when we allow men to be their emotional, connected, and vulnerable selves, all the things, like I said, that underlie healthy masculinities, they're also more likely to care for others around them. 
They're six times more likely to care for their child's emotional needs, their older family members' physical needs, and like I said, eight times more likely to care for their partner. Next slide, please. The next finding that we had is that the face of caring is changing, yet it's slow. Kendra, can you press the next button? What we find is that men say they are doing care and they're willing to take action to do more, but many barriers, structural, norm-based, individual, and financial to this equal sharing remain. Though our new research finds hope, like other data in this field, the pace of change is far too slow. Next slide, please. So in this graph, I wouldn't ask you to look at every single piece in this graph, but I think it'll be important to see that the brown bars are mother's report of how many hours they spend on care. And the blue bars are father's report of how many hours they spend on care. And it's clear that across all care tasks from caring for the child and more, um, mothers are spending more hours on care than fathers do. Yet what's encouraging here is that men's care hours are ranging from an average of two to three and a half, uh, 3.7 hours. Most men do report that they perform some kind of care responsibilities for a considerable number of hours in the day. What we do know, however, is that men tend to overreport their hours of care. And what we don't have in this sample is women reporting on their partner's hours spent on care. And there's also country variations. In India, Lebanon, and Turkey, the gap in care hours is much more. But when we look at these kind of global trends, what we see is that perhaps the care gap may be closing, um, it's particularly in certain countries. And we do need more data to continue to see if this caring, sort of care, men's caregiving is becoming more of a norm across the world. Speaking of norms, we also see in the data that there is some room for optimism. And perhaps, as I mentioned, things are changing even if it's slow. 32% of men and 27% of women say that changing diapers, giving kids a bath, and feeding kids are a mother's responsibility. That's a much smaller percentage of people who are agreeing with this statement of women's responsibilities in, as a caregiver, as a nurturer, than we have seen in our other um, samples and uh, surveys before. Next slide, please. So we sort of try to understand what could be a catalyst for perhaps this care gap slowly closing. And though we did not examine these correlations, we did ask whether men and women's care work increased, decreased, or stayed the same during the lockdown period following the UN Women data. What we saw was in our data that the brown bar showed that without a doubt, mothers continue to say that they perform more care um, work than men do. And while the differences between women and men for most of these, as you can see, are not that huge, well, particularly we see a smaller difference in preparing food and household logistics. So it is possible that during COVID, um, there was perhaps a shift in reducing the care gap, again, depending on the country, and maybe we're continuing to see those gains even today. Next slide, please. So what we recognize is that change must be both at structural level and at individual level. I want to give you one more statistic from our norms data. More than 80% of men and women in, both, in all our countries disagreed that boys should not be taught how to sew, cook, clean, or take care of siblings, meaning that they agree that boys should be encouraged to do care activities. So we need to kind of build on this momentum and recognize that there's possibility of structural change. Next slide, please. And what we find is that engaging men in advocacy for care policies may be key. We found that more than half of both mothers and fathers said that political activism for care leave policies was important for them. And like I said, lots of country variations, but it ranged from 57% to 94%. This, in other words, it suggests that men are willing to vote for politicians who put care at the center of their agenda as well. Next slide, please. And nevertheless, numerous, numerous barriers, especially in uh, sort of cost and poor public offering settings um, are in the way that pro pro uh, allow parents to have the support they need to do the care work. Almost one third of the 
4,000 participants who said they do not have the child care support say that the cost and lack of publicly funded child care are, are at the top of their list um, in order for them to feel like they're being supported in their caregiving. Reaffirming that often um, in order for men and women to feel supported, the shift has to be at structural level. Next slide, please. So what does this mean and what can we do about this? We came up with a set of recommendations around the acronym CARING, C-A-R-I-N-G. And these recommendations are built on our previous State of the World's Fathers reports, as well as our Men Cares 50-50 commitment, which is asking governments, employers, and individual men to commit to enacting the changes in structures, policies, attitudes, and behaviors that lead to care being valued and shared equally. What we see, I won't go through all the recommendations, um, one by one, only because of time, um, is that what we see is that we're calling on men and women and boys to worldwide and those who influence and shape the lives of men and boys to join feminist voices in holding leaders, politicians, workplace, institutions, and decision makers accountable for the changes that need to happen to make care equality a reality and to build an economy based on care, not just profit. And many men and boys are perhaps already becoming, beginning to become allies for the cause. And we owe it to our children, our grandchildren, to make the world a more caring and gender equal space. So therefore, we reaffirm care must be at the center of the political, social, and economic plans and spending and built into structures and institutions. Women have been asking for this for decades. And when men do the same together, we can change our world so that care is at the center of everything we do. In times of crisis, as the world is going through today, we have no option but to join this long and still unfinished revolution in care. Last slide, please. Just a quick thank you to all our participants, contributors, supporters, research partners, and of course, the Men Care Partner Council. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tavisi. That was great. And I want to encourage other people. I know uh, Vessel had dropped some links, uh, not only to the Men Care 5050 commitments, um, but also to uh, the, the actual report itself. Uh, you can find those, the link to the report in the in the chat. I encourage others to, to dig into it. There's, I think what was presented today is a small portion of the data that is in there. So please jump in and and and, and write about it, blog about it, put it on the on the uh, list serves that you you participate in. Uh, make the conversation about this bigger, uh, and 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 add to this, and and put your own perspective on it too. Uh, we see some of those perspectives coming through in the chat. We need more of this conversation because otherwise, um, these projects stand alone. And if you if you don't get into this and engage this conversation either on social media or through the work that you're doing. Um, we can't make the links of, of this work and integrate men into programming a little bit more in a way in which that's both beneficial for them, but also beneficial for their families and, and, and their partners. So uh, at this moment, I was so excited to get things moving this morning. Um, I forgot that we had a couple of poll questions, and I would I would really like to uh, put those poll questions up here now. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and we'll, before we introduce uh, uh, Ramadan, uh, if we have a couple of poll questions for you. I'll read them aloud. Um, and the first one is, are you caring for children? We want to learn a little bit more about you and, and the care the care that you're giving in your uh, uh, your life and how that kind of plays out. So um, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment and answering those poll questions uh, for us, uh, we'll take a little bit of we'll get a better understanding about you and the care that you you sir you provide in your in your life uh, on a daily basis. So the first question is, are you caring for children under 18 in your home? Some of you may be, some others not. Um, you know, the, we're all at different phases of life in, in, the, life, in the life course. Uh, and also, are you caring for elderly over 65? Is anyone uh, providing that care uh, to, the, to the older people in their lives, in intergenerational families and things like that? Okay, and then we kind of look at you know how much care, and the last question about how many hours uh, those types that type of care give uh, requires, and we know that you can kind of also kind of 
balance this with some of the data that's in the uh, State of the World Fathers Report, uh, which provides both male and female um, feedback and insights. Um, and we can kind of understand that uh, that, that dynamic and, and start to think about, to contextualize this in our own experiences. Okay, so we see we do have a lot of parents in this in this audience, which is great, uh, and others who are not parents yet, or maybe well, may never. It's up to them, right? So uh, the parenting question: We see a lot of people are caring for uh, more than half of our audience is caring for uh, children under eighteen, and and also we have uh, fewer, but a large portion, about a third of our audience is, is caring for people over sixty five, um, and we can see that that care for individuals over 65 is uh, a few hours. Um, I don't think we put a time frame on this, but a few hours uh, a day on that, uh, that care. We can see the distribution on that. So thank you very much. It's good to, good to get a framework for this, start thinking about how, the, how this contextualizes on our own experience. Um, and we, we can close out that poll and we will move on to uh, Ramadan. We can share, or are we sharing the results now? Is that how that works, Marcella? Sorry about that. So you can see we have a little bit more than half of our audience are caring for individuals under, under uh, 18, about a third again, over 65, and then that distribution of care for individuals over 65 in the home are, are on a regular basis. Great. All right. Was everybody, I think people were able to see the results so just to make sure. I'm not certain, but I hope so. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, Ramadan, our next speaker. Um, uh, Ramadan BK from Impact and Innovations Development Center or IIDC uh, is a design monitoring and evaluation, quality improvement and scale up specialist. He has experience in intervention design and implementation in areas of HIV, immunization, gender-based violence, and violence against children, oh, uh, orphans and vulnerable children programming, sexual and reproductive health and rights and family planning, and social accountability for health. Ramadan is a member uh, and fellow of the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, European Implementation Collaborative, Regional Monitor for Social and Gender Norms Programming for IIDC, Learning Partners in East Africa, and also member of the Care Seeking and Referral for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health and Urban Health Communities of Practice. I mean, pretty busy. Kind of spread across a lot of organizations. Uh, currently, he's a he's technical advisor at Adaptation, Scale-Up, and Quality Improvement at IIDC and supports organizations working to, pr uh, to promoting gender, uh, child rights, women's rights, male caregiving, and sexual and reproductive health and rights in East and Southern Africa. So Ramadan, would you please take it away? Thank you, Dominic. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here to share about uh, our learning story. Um, as uh, Introduced um, Ramadan uh, Bob Chirunda and I work for IIDC um, based in Kampala, although currently I'm in Dar es Salaam uh, supporting um, one of our partners. Now, um, I'm going to share learnings from um, a male caregiving convening conducted in 2022, which led to the development of um, a very promising male caregiving roadmap uh, for East and Southern Africa. So um, first of all, in terms of our work at IIDC, we are a technical assistance organization um, and a learning facilitator. Uh, we support different organizations in program design and norms integration, safeguarding uh, m &E, adaptation scale up um, from a TA uh, perspective. Next slide, please. Now, as a learning facilitator, we are not 
really implement us and I, I, I want to underscore um, the approach to our work and how we conducted this convening. Um, we facilitated a learning and reflection process. And this process is what gave birth to this uh, male caregiving uh, agenda that I'm going to talk about, next slide. We know that um, historically, much, uh, you know, and much more culturally, women um, are expected and have been always expected by the society to do caregiving work. Um, for example, doing a lot of parenting work, uh, looking at, after, you know, the sick people. Uh, and it goes into even, you know, professional work that some professions like nurses are female uh, dominated and they are looked at as female oriented and therefore they attract less of, of um, the men. However, this shouldn't be the case. Men in caregiving roles and professions are often seen um, as an exception, they are discriminated against and there isn't enough evidence, you know, especially for Sub-Saharan Africa to, to demonstrate that male caregiving is actually normal and, can, you know, is, is acceptable as we have in um, the, the, the North. Next slide. With the various benefits and positive outcomes that are associated with male caregiving. Yeah, you know, ranging from better cognitive development, education, you know, you know fewer behavioral challenges and problems, greater capacity. The benefits of male caregiving are really clear. They are enormous, there are so many, and they are, they are self-evident. But at the same time, especially in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that male caregiving, these benefits notwithstanding, male care is still extremely low, extremely low. And this is the background that made us, uh, you know, to design a convening that really brings together practitioners, researchers, to look at where the problem is, yeah? There is a lot of, you know, um, positivity about from male caregiving, but the, the agenda is, is, is really not as, as, it doesn't have the momentum that uh, was really required. Next slide. So in 20, next slide, please. So in 2022, uh, with support uh, from Hilton and other donors, we convened this learning convening, yeah? And the idea was to bring organizations that are practicing pro programs, projects, experts in research, in ECD, in male engagement, to really try to understand where the problem is. Because at the end of the day, without this understanding on why male engagement interventions exist and they are moving in silo, why we'll have ECD interventions and child focused interventions also moving in a different direction. Yet the benefits of integrating the two are self evident and much more than implementing, you know, a, a single focused uh, in, a intervention. We decided to bring this together into a learning convening to share experience. And this included both um, evidence-based practitioners, but also indigenous uh, knowledge and practice-based organizations, because we also found out that there are some, it's, it's not that actually culture and uh, maybe norms are entirely negative and they, they don't support uh, caregiving. Next slide. So we designed a convening um, 
with, and I, with the aim and uh, thought that even after the convening, the conversations were going to continue. The conversations about male caregiving were going to proceed. So the idea was to amplify, connect, uh, and build momentum up, you know, with partners in East and Southern Africa. During the convening, the idea was to identify, analyze the key enablers um, and, and barriers to male uh, engagement, integrating male engagement and um, uh, child care, develop a profile of scalable models that uh, can be adapted by other partners, and then develop a roadmap after the convening that would support other partners to join the coalition of uh, male engagement and support this agenda in East and Southern Africa, but also identify key resources that would now uh, would be organized in a manner that takes this agenda forward. Next slide. Next slide, please. So during the convening, um, we categorized interventions into three. Uh, the previous slide, please. We categorized uh, interventions into three, um, institutional or center-based uh, interventions, community-based interventions, and integrated interventions. Now, these across a whole range of health and social care, multi-sectoral, looking at which um, you know, models are in health, are in social care, are in gender, across the spectrum. Next slide. Now, next slide, please. So among the issues that really came up strongly in terms of the enablers, Previous slide, please. Among the enablers, we identified, of course, the policy environment as, as very supportive. Um, and like, uh, you know, the previous uh, presenter noted, the culture and tradition, uh, culture is, is still at the center of, of male caregiving. And also, of course, it's, uh, uh, while it's this, you know, an, an enabler of integration, it is also a barrier to, to the integration of uh, child care and mental caregiving interventions. So we identified uh, this through the conversations at the uh, mental caregiving convey. Next slide. So these are some of the organizations uh, that, that now form in the initial coalition. The, the idea was to bring these practitioners together and kind of think, uh, go into the thought process on how we can take male caregiving forward. And these are the uh, partners that uh, supported the male, uh, male caregiving convening and are part of that of the roadmap. Next slide. Now, we envisioned the roadmap and came up with um, uh, a vision, goal, and objective. The 22 organizations and entities and programs uh, thought that it would be good to have uh, a well-focused um, roadmap that looks at both the current but also the future. The key objective that I, I may want to focus on is supporting indigenous organizations, civil society organizations, researchers, governments, uh, to mobilize resources for sustained male caregiving interventions. So um, this is how it looks like, giving a direction on where I want to go. Next slide. These are the objectives that the coalition came up with. Seven um, objectives of the you know, caregiving, ranging from building the capacity of, of practitioners and actors, um, documenting, um, building a multicultural coalition, but also engaging donors. Next slide. Uh, this is um, a, a busy slide, but I thought it could kind of show that for each and every objective, we have some strategic actions that were proposed. Of course, these are not yet put in, in practice 
uh, for now it's a roadmap, but to show that we, uh, the, the partners have really thought, the, the organizations, the researchers, implementers and experts think that to take the Melkia giving work forward in Eastern Southern Africa, this is, these are the objectives and key strategic actions that have to be taken. Most importantly, capacity, um, a joint implementation framework, but also having joint fundraising and resource mobilization. Next slide. So finally, as we move forward, um, as a coalition, of course, um, of multiple organizations, IIDC is working to continue connecting these partners together, to continue uh, creating learning opportunities to see how this uh, caregiving roadmap can, can be taken forward. Um, of course, essential is the fact that we, we have to leverage and build on each other's strengths for co-learning, capacity sharing, uh, continue convening, develop a movement, um, you know, a multi-country movement with other partners, but also not forget that culture and cultural values are at the center of this work. Next slide. Thank you for listening to me. Um, back to you, Dominic. Thank you so much, Ramadan. Uh, and, and I think kind of this gets at the point that convening, kind of understanding what work is happening in this space is, is critical in moving it forward. The, I, the roadmap, um, yeah, the slides are a little busy, but we also have an opportunity to kind of really dig in there. Uh, we will share those slides with folks afterward, but kind of dig into what those, those decision points and what the targets are for those uh, activities. And that's really helpful for, for the audience, I believe. So I think thank you so much for, for presenting and sharing the, the organization and the vision that uh, and, and the outcomes of that meeting that you all had had. Um, uh, at this point, we're gonna transition uh, to the panel um, and I'm gonna introduce our, our host of our panel, uh, who is Dr. Peter Weiswa. Uh, we have three panelists today who will kind of talk about some of their experiences, both convening organizations, as well as implementing programs and, and helping design programs. Uh, and with my introduction here, uh, uh, Peter, let me read a little bit about him. Uh, you may you may know him uh, from other work. He's a newer member of the Mail Engagement Task Force, and we're really happy to have him. Uh, and uh, Dr. Weiswa was uh, is an associate professor of health policy planning and management uh, of the School of Public Health at Macquarie University uh, of Health Sciences. His focus areas are mainly reproductive health, maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, he is a leading African academic with over 150 review, uh, peer-reviewed publications, including books. Uh, Dr. Weiswa well, is actively involved in local, national, and global policymaking and implementation. And he's also a member of the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group of Experts uh, for Maternal and Newborn and Child Adolescent Health and Nutrition, uh, which currently provides independent advice to WHO Director, uh, the Director General. Uh, Dr. Weissor is a co-lead of the USAID Mail Engagement Task Force uh, and the Agency for All Project, which is led by University of California in San Diego. Um, Peter, I'll hand it over to you and you can introduce our other panelists uh, and uh, welcome our, uh, you're welcome to the to the podcast. Or sorry, our webinar. <laughs> Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Dominic. I'm not, if, if uh, the host can help show my video. Uh, because I'm not able to show the video. No. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for the discussions. Um, we are now going to have a panel. We have Yella uh, Talabos and then my colleague Godfrey Seu and uh, Tom Chachiat. Uh, I'm going to read their profiles briefly. Uh, so um, Thomas uh, Churchyard, who is uh, qualified with an MPH uh, and the CANTAP, is an international consultant and trainer specializing in male engagement, in gender transformation, violence prevention, and men's health programming. Between 2012 and 2023, Thomas also served as the founder and executive director of Quaka uh, in the in, in, in the Yosa, a Swatini based CSO specializing in gender, health, and social 
justice interventions which engage men and boys um, uh, in the general. So I'm going to request um, Thomas to briefly introduce himself, but also a little bit about his organization. Uh, Thomas. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as was introduced, my name is Thomas Churchard. Uh, and for many years, I, I ran an organization I founded here in Eswatini called Guaca in Vodza, um, uh, which it means building a man in, in Siswati. And uh, we, we work with male engagement for gender-based violence and health programming here in, in Eswatini. Uh, principally today, I'm going to be talking about Babalo Kobvo, which is a program and a campaign uh, run by Guakin Vodza for the last few years, uh, which principally targets men in fatherhood and caregiving roles. So it's going to be a pleasure to be part of the panel. Thanks, Peter. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Next, um, uh, uh, our panelists include Yela Talabusi. Yela is a social anthropologist with experience in the topics of gender, care and economic justice, migration, public and public policy. She has a master's degree from the University of Oxford and a bachelor's from the American University of Beirut. Uh, she worked in the National Institute of Women of Mexico and as a consultant for various international agencies and academic institutions such as the International Development Research Center of Canada and the Columbia University. Kalete Yala is the Outreach and Advocacy Officer at the Global Alliance for Care. Yala, if you could do, uh, briefly introduce uh, yourself and your organization. Sure, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, so I'm Yara, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Global Alliance for Care. So we are a multi-stakeholder initiative which was launched in the context of the Generation Equality Forum in 2021 by the National Institute of Women of Mexico and UN Women. And it was launched um, based on an urgent call to action which we made to governments, international organizations, civil society, private sector, the philanthropic organizations and other very strategic partners to take concerted action and to reduce inequalities and promote a cultural transformation related to care by guaranteeing the five hours of care, recognizing, reducing, redistributing, rewarding and representing care among every core responsible actor. Today, we have a little over two years after our founding, we have over 149 members from all of the sectors previously mentioned, and we seek to have them collaborate and act collectively to advance the care agenda based on a principle of co-responsibility, co-responsibility amongst all sectors of society, but also gender respons co-responsibility amongst men and women. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Yara. Uh, next is um, actually somebody I know quite well, because I work with him. Uh, Dr. Godfrey Siu Etiang is a lecturer at the Child Health and Women's Center, College of Health Sciences, McKay University. He's also an assistant professor at the Medical Research Council Unit at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in, in the UK. His current, his current work focuses on developing and evaluating interventions on parenting and families to reduce sexual and gender-based violence and child abuse and improve children's health and well-being and an understanding of men's risk relationship with adolescent girls and young women. A good for your welcome if you could also Briefly introduce yourself and your organization. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. That's me. And thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm really privileged. I feel honored to be here uh, with very like minded people on a topic that is so important to all of us all. And just to say briefly, I'm currently working with the Department of Child Health and Development Center, <laughs> which is in Makere University. And happy to see you. Uh, Julie and Anne, as well as um, Wenzo, all of these are mentioned because we've done work together on understanding male partners of adolescent girls, understanding fathers in Uganda and elsewhere. And currently I'm involved with my team that's on, on this call 
uh, developing parenting interventions. And one particular one that is so interesting that has helped us to learn incredible lessons is called Parenting for Respectability. And I'm happy to say more about that later. But the focus is, is really on understanding how to involve men and, and keep them in a parenting program so as to improve benefits for all, all the stakeholders involved, including men themselves. Thank you, so, thank you so much, good friend. Now, I'm going to turn to each of you and um, I, will, I, will, I will start with Thomas. Thomas, I would like to start with a general question. What are the most prominent forms of caregiving you work on? And what do you see men being most receptive to? And which forms of caregiving uh, open the door to other opportunities to share caregiving uh, with others? If you could tell us a little bit about how your work uh, works to bring in uh, caregiving um, where men are involved. Thomas. Sure, be happy to, thanks. Um, so I think in, in terms of our work in Eswatini, uh, the, our focus with Babalot Kofor has been principally on engaging men as present and positive father figures in the role in, in the lives of their children um and particularly in in the early childhood development phase but of course with children uh, of all ages as well uh, we find that men uh like in many countries and particularly in southern africa see their role as principally putting bread on the table or, or as a breadwinning capacity uh, and uh in in very little else and so our project for the last few years and the advocacy and campaigns that have surrounded it have all been based on the benefits for men and the benefits for the family holistically of men's engagement in uh in caregiving with their with their children and particularly the role that men can play in uh, areas that they don't usually find themselves very comfortable in in their Swatini context at least which is things like uh, in play, in, in homework, in emotional support, and sort of uh, encouraging and also celebrating men when they do so, uh, when they do enter these areas uh, of their child's lives, because uh, the benefits to, to them, obviously, and the benefits to their families are, as we know from the, from the international research, many fold. Um, and so for us, I think the doorway has been to engage men through a, uh, a a lens of of the benefit of uh of of these kinds of engagement with their on their children but uh, and on their children's lives and development social development future success academic success and so on but also uh from there there's obviously further conversations we can have about gender equality about domestic and unpaid domestic work uh, and about uh, caring for elderly and, and disabled family members as well. Okay, uh, thank you so much, um, Thomas. And uh, then, Yella, in terms of your, your organization and the, in general, you know, from your knowledge, how should the care policies engage a man in caregiving? And what do you see as some of these uh, opportunities that open doors for share caregiving with others? Okay, thank you, Peter. So I think, first of all, I'd like to begin uh, talking about how, how we tackle the issue of care at the Alliance. So, of course, we consider care to be all of these activities which contribute to the well-being of persons, physical, emotional, and mental, mental well-being. So these can include direct activities such as feeding a baby or, or, or helping a child with, with homework, but also indirect care tasks like cooking, cleaning, getting the groceries, etc., um, but considering that, we've also been trying to broaden a bit the vision and the definition of care work to include various other activities. I was seeing, I was taking a look at the chat and I was seeing that many people were talking about how does care apply in other contexts and how can we understand care if it's, for example, taking care of somebody who is not inside the household. So we, we also want to incorporate the, this view of care to, to, to show the economic and social contributions of these activities, which are usually the responsibility of women. So we can include such thing as care of the environment, care of land and territory, protection of, of natural resources from seizures, from, from privatization, from climate change, uh, care of communities in case, in case of public health crisis, such as those caused by COVID or 
or HIV, the preservation of identity, all of these things fall under, under the, the category of care. So we believe that uh, policies, programs, um, uh, care actions should be um, visibilizing the contributions of people in these in these sectors of care, and uh, um, these kind of show us that that when we focus on care, we are focusing on a, on a different way of making social relations based on an, on the recognition of inter interdependence between all living beings. So we believe that this kind of this understanding of care can also help men and help disturb gender roles, because as as Bob Tavishi, as Tom was also mentioning, these traditional models of masculinity and the undervalorization of of care is also harmful to men because they have to to conform to certain models which are alienating, which see them as only providers, as as only uh, um, as, as people who should not be emotional or should not be dependent, even though in practice this is impossible. So this is a bit what we try to promote through our advocacy activities with, with policy makers, through learning and exchanges of experiences and through our communications activities. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think this is definitely interesting. I'll turn to Godfrey. In terms of your, your work, uh, what are the most important prominent forms of caregiving that you work on? And what do you say, um, men being most receptive of, I mean, men in Uganda, uh, and which forms of caregiving open the door for other opportunities for share caregiving with others? A good friend. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that question. Um, what kind of caregiving are we focusing on and what do men find most receptive? Very interesting question. So our entry point has been uh, violence prevention and promoting uh, positive male caregiving, reducing uh, harsh punishment. But we also focus a lot on the development of attachment and positive connection between fathers and children, uh, parental bonding and attachment. We also focus on improving spousal relationships because there's a dimension of caregiving that actually affects children in very many direct ways. Uh, the, 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 the idea is that if we combine uh, programming on you know, violence prevention between spouses and improving spousal relationships, then the benefits translate more directly to the children. And so we've been looking at all this as a way to address an important concern of men. So men are very particular about what motivates them in caregiving. Uh, in, in Uganda, especially through research that we conducted, men's core motivation is to maintain or achieve family respectability. That is often you know, realized through good behavior of children. And so fathers tend to enforce discipline sometimes in a very violent way. And so we are drawing on this core motivation to promote uh, positive masculinity. And interestingly, this has become a dominant this, uh, topic of discussion already in this, in this uh, among the, the panelists. So we draw on this to promote positive masculinity, respectful masculinities, and how can how men can be assisted to, to develop this without being harsh, without being violent, by being positively present. So, you know, sometimes we encourage men to be present, to be involved. But in, in many settings in sub-Saharan Africa, Uganda inclusive, when a man is present at home, many times, their presence can be seen to be negative in the sense that they are harsh, they administer harsh discipline, they are rude, everybody runs away from them or wants to avoid them. So we are changing this perspective that if you are a father, your role must be uh, to be a positive uh, person. So your presence is important. You need to connect with the children, need to connect with your spouse. So we are promoting yeah. this and we have realized that yeah. One important thing is to draw from those positive motivations and to present the, the program as being one that targets fathers in their own right and not always as, you know, as supporters or because of the benefits that the children should realize or the, or the spouse should realize. Thank you, uh, good friend. You should do definitely 
make the trip to the School of Public Health in Macaire and give us some tips. Uh, Thomas, um, could you share some success stories or examples of how your program has positively impacted uh, caregivers and their roles within families and communities? And do you have any outcomes you would like to uh, comment on, Thomas? Sure. I think I think the 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 thing that I'd like to highlight with all, all sorts of social behavior change programming, but particularly in engaging men in 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 what is still seen to be sometimes as a sensitive topic uh, or, or a topic of uh, of uh, where where your participants are not naturally inclined perhaps to 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 engage is first of all uh, it, it's a bit of a cliche now, but the importance of that space is key. And I think, you know, Equimundo previously, Primundo did some great work highlighting and emphasizing the value of the space um, that you create with the interpersonal programs uh, that engage men in behavior change uh, outcomes. But what we've experienced here in Esotini is by, mold, by, by layering uh, the interventions so that you have not just the interpersonal at community level, the sort of role model male uh, groups of men uh, discussing these issues uh, in a sort of typical behavior change setting uh, or typical behavior change format. But, but from there, you can go into national advocacy uh, and using traditional media and social media and pull out stories from those, from those communities that you can then highlight on a national stage. So to give you that example a little bit, um, when, when we talk to men and we find a role model in the community, then we can use that role model in our, uh, in our social media posts. We then take a, you know, a photographer and we can, you can generate real local stories and local role models by, by identifying those people from your community interventions. And then you can take those individuals as we have in Estatini all the way through to, to lobbying uh, environments and to to think about policy change and to use them as testimonials and um, as case studies for engaging policy makers and decision makers when we talk about fatherhood leave, uh, or paternity leave for instance or when we talk about um, uh, men's uh, women's access to to credit without a male without a male approval and those kind of things at the very at the very uh, national level at the, at the lobbying level so having those kind of that transcendence between those three the, those three levels of programming the community based behavior change the national advocacy and then your sort of more strategic lobbying uh, has really worked for us i think it's so much too much i'm actually wondering um uh, men you know beginning to learn all these things as adults when do we go to scale and uh, reach every body and where do we even find a man so i'm going to turn to Yella, and um, in many contexts, like maybe in Mexico, traditional gender roles and norms can influence caregiving dynamics. In particular within health, how does your program, your organization, or from what you know, navigate and address these gender dynamics, norms, and stereotypes to promote greater male involvement in caregiving? Yella. So I think here I can answer a bit for the work that our membership is doing in general and um, the challenges and, and, and opportunities they faced in order to, to address these, these norms and, and stereotypes. So we've usually seen that states are usually more willing to assume care responsibilities faster than, 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 than men are to, to contribute to this, to, this, uh, to this issue. So something we've seen is that care systems can be set up where where there can be you know child care services health services directed towards towards men uh, uh, sorry towards children and uh, and people with disabilities or elderly persons but it is still women who go and 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 take the children to those services or make use of these services so even if states take on this responsibility this does not mean that there is a redistribution within society between between men and women so i think uh, some of the ways in which our membership has has tackled that is to change the perception of care itself, because care, since it is seen as something that is, you know, women's natural responsibility, something that does not require care, um, policies which seek to professionalize 
care through certification, through uh, training, through, through providing credentials for carers, usually make care professions such as nursing, such as caring for children or elderly persons more attractive. And they make them uh, maybe something that, that can be better remunerated, a better professional opportunity. So this can be more attractive to all persons, women and men. Um, also, another, another uh, possibility to change and work on these gender norms is through education. So we know the classic example of, of, uh, of a care system in the district city of Bogota, which um, provided care services in, in an accessible form through care blocks where, where care services can be, can be accessed in minimal time so as not to, to increase women's time poverty. So this is a bit more the, the, the more well-known aspect of the program. But another aspect, less discussed aspect of the program is a care, caring school for men and for mostly, mostly directed towards men and boys. So it not only um, mm -hmm. tackles the importance of care and its contribution to society, but it also gives you practical knowledge on how to care, how to do laundry, how to deal with a temper tantrum, which, is, which are things that are usually um, transmitted from mother to daughter and are not seen as, as you know, actual knowledge, but this kind of education, this talking about it in a public setting through sometimes online classes, in-person classes, has really proved to be one of the most popular, popular uh, aspects of the program. Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. I know in the, uh, one of our projects, uh, Ages for All, we, we have a project in Niger we are studying where there are many schools. Uh, it will be interesting to see how do you actually reach men and begin to educate them when they are big adults. Uh, Godfrey, similarly, these gender roles and norms operate in the broader environment surrounding caregivers. Uh, what are the social, economic, and other structural barriers at hinder men's roles in caregiving? How does your program collaborate with uh, local communities, governments, and other organizations to address these and create a supportive environment for male caregivers? Good friend. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that that first part of the question are actually addressed by, um, by Ramadan. He highlighted the norms and, 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 and how these act as barriers. But if I have to add, I think really the, the norms around masculinity still are, are a big challenge. And, and I think what we need to invest our time is, in doing is not so much to, 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 to transform as, as in the sense of you know, challenging the existing negative, uh, the existing norms of masculinity in totality, but rather to draw from the positive norms of masculinity. And I think for me, that would be the takeaway message. So what is it within the norms around what it means to be a father, what it means to be a man, that we can take away and and you know run with that because if you begin from there then you're likely to 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 attract more men you know for a long time i think our approach has been to blame men to you know criticize them as perpetrators as you know but men are equally they are victims they are they are partners they are allies and i think once men begin to hear a positive uh, message calling them running them then they can easily come to you know to, to the table and say okay let's let's discuss this but of course as you said there's a very strong social influence at the community level at, at the societal level that still needs to be uh, addressed if you have a few men changing the so many others who are not changing are likely to become a barrier to them and they will be you know criticizing they will be questioning and so the social pressure will still bear on men. And this is one of the lessons we learned. And so the change may just be for a short time and then the, the changed men will relapse back, you know, sort of backsliding because the broader societal environment is still a problem. So we need to complement interventions, I think. Once you do community-based interventions, let them be supported by a national level advocacy, by policies and so on. I give an example. And the in, friend, on that, how do you work with um, local communities and the government uh, around within your work? So let's begin with government. We have a, an, a, another parenting program that we are supporting government to develop at the national level, which is really to shape the national parenting policy landscape. 
And we created what's called the Parenting Agenda Consortium together with the government to try and you know, bring stakeholders together to share, but most importantly, to, to, to caucus around or to, so to build a consensus around parenting work. And one of the things that has emerged very strongly is the core uh, role of fathers and how to involve fathers. And so we, we get guidance from government, but we also provide government with, with data, with information, with, you know, with technical support. And I think that's a very productive way to do it. So now government is in a better position to actually rally different members, organizations that are doing work and questioning them and supporting them by shaping a policy strategy. The government has now developed what they call the national standards for parenting programs through uh, the support that we give. And this is meant to, you know, to be a tool for assessing the quality of programming around parenting. And so I think one of the things is in there is to, to promote male engagement. At the community level, we work with different, uh, we identify different uh, structures of power and sources of influence and reach through that. But of course, community leaders remain uh, gatekeepers in many ways, and they must be uh, the target. We work at, at community level also, we work with groups of men and groups of women. And this structure of delivery of parenting interventions is really good for sustaining men's participation. Men want a, a space where they are comfortable, at least initially, because as you said, they are learning to give care. They fear- Thank you, God Thank you so much. I, I think we could talk over this for a very yeah, long time. Yeah, I know, time. I know. I can't wait to say, you know, when um, we had COVID and schools in Uganda, we are locked down for two years, our kids became pregnant and it was clear that we are doing very bad parenting. So at this stage, we are going to go into the Q&A and I would like to uh, invite um, our listeners, our participants, if you have a question, please raise up your hand, but also to request um, my colleagues if there are questions you've noted, uh, we might have to read them out. Uh, are there any hands that we, uh, or somebody would like to ask a question? Do they what, have permission? To, yes, you know, why don't we uh, start Jenny. with the, um, there's a question in here around religion and integrating religion. Uh, uh, they specifically asked, do you have any experience about involving religious institutions and in men's caregiving programs or initiatives uh, or the concept of positive masculinity in general? So uh, barriers and facilitators. So maybe there's a component of religion that the panelists could mention uh, as well, because we know that can be a very powerful um, channel to work through. Yeah, any of the panelists that is ready for this question, please take it on. Well, I think I can go first. I, we don't work directly with religious institutions yet, but that's what we are just planning to start. However, we know that religious uh, faith-based institutions have a structure that is well organized already, for instance, in, in Uganda, in the Anglican and Catholic faith, there is groups for women and men. And so these can be you know, very, very good channels for delivery of interventions and running men, men's involvement. What's also clear in, is that the, the manual that we have supported government to develop right now has a module on, on parenting and religiosity. This is to acknowledge that yes, many parents believe in the powerful influence of religion in shaping their children's lives. And so we're encouraging the parents to support that process, but also to get involved because if, if the religion just, children don't just become religious, they, they have to be instructed. And so it is an entry point that I think we will really benefit from since religious institutions are everywhere. The majority of people in, in Sub-Saharan Africa will identify with some religion at least. Uh, thank you, Godfrey, for, for that. Okay. Uh, Yala or Thomas, do you want to add to this? I think on my part, I would- I can just brief. Sorry, I think somebody's in the yeah. Okay, yeah, please maybe go first then, Thomas. Yeah. 
Okay, so I, I would basically echo what Godfrey was saying that that religious organizations institutions have this this incredible reach within communities and they can be key key gatekeepers that can be allied with also I, I would think in the in the realm of communications in order to think about messaging that is culturally pertinent and relevant for the communities and how to communicate this this difficult topic that is usually very very um, uh, taboo or seen or seen as as, as non questionable. I think if we if we ally with with these sorts of religious cultural organizations which have a, a a big reach and influence on the ground, it's a very effective way. It could be a very effective way of of working towards social 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 and cultural change. Thomas, uh, very quickly. Uh... Partially, yes, I think it's an area that we could all probably improve on a little bit more. And I know Tier Fund and others have done some good work on this, but um, I think they're very much a religion, very much a facilitator for for our work if we uh, if we can engage it in the right way and we can we can partner with religious institutions in the right way. We we've used religious facilitators or religious leaders who have been trained as facilitators here in Eswatini. I've recently written a, a manual for for Burkina Faso for for the momentum integrated health and resilience program under USAID in in Burkina Faso that that engages partially at least community leaders and and uh, Muslim and Christian faith leaders as as facilitators of of a main engagement program as well so it's possible uh one it is also a, a bit of a, a a point that we need to highlight as a risk we we often find that uh uh male engagement and generally positive parenting messaging is well received here uh, until we get to positive discipline and we do find I don't know whether Godfrey has found the same in Uganda but I, I know that others have in other contexts that um that that when it comes to positive discipline uh you know men in particular see that as as their role and a role that uh if they were to forsake that not only would they be losing the control of their children but also in some religious texts going against you know the well-cited uh biblical verse that says uh, spare the rod spoil the child for instance and and uh that that is actually uh, something that we need to navigate in some ways um examples like that that, that reinforce men's role as disciplinarian and and violence against children ultimately as well thanks uh, thank you so much i'll read out maybe one or two more questions uh, Somebody is asking that how do you avoid creating gender exploitation models that, uh, for example, use men as uh, leaders in a way that move us, I think, moves men into yet another uh, sphere of control uh, over women? In other words, how do we promote this? Uh, whereas, not really. Uh, I'm doing um, or making it worse uh, for women that men become stronger and even come with even more control. I think that is one of the concerns. And in Uganda, there are some aspects even where women say, this is my role in the home. Anybody would like to take on this one? Uh, Godfrey here. I think for me, it's really to agree that that's a very important question. And it's a warning to all of us as we, you know, we, we promote male engagement. Uh, we need to be aware of the potential negative consequences of this, especially on women and also children. Mm -hmm. And I think we have documented some of these consequences in our own research where we found that fathers were increasingly encroaching the space that the women traditionally considered there. So the women's space becomes more constrained, constricted, but also fathers begin to uh, to monitor women more and to say uh, they, they they think that they are, the fathers are more receptive to the changes in the program, the, the, you know, the behavior. And we have to be very careful about this. But having said that, it sh we shouldn't fear to actually engage men, even if we are to draw on these norms around most masculinity. What is important is really to ask men to, to reflect on how these norms are uh, impacting their own lives, the lives of the children, and the lives of the other family members, the, the, the wives and so on. I think that's very critical. Thank you so much, Godfrey. So Godfrey, I'm going to ask each of you, um, give in half a minute, 
your last uh, take home message uh, for the public here. Let me start with Godfrey, since you're, yeah. you're already pinned here. It, yeah, it's not easy, but I say, I think my message is, can we begin to talk with funders to also um, support our efforts to integrate male caregiving into interventions? Many times you find a funder is saying my, my, my mandate is on ECD. Another is saying my mandate is on violence. And then they cannot come together to fund or to, you know, to support this kind of joint programming. We've acknowledged that violence against children and violence against women and others are interlinked. So how do we remain compartmentalizing this in, in funding and in implementation? Thank you so much. Uh, Thomas? Thanks. Um, I think I just wanted to message? share a very quick. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it, it's not quite a take home message. It's, uh, I suppose, something that hasn't been raised yet, but is important is, is that uh, I think when we're designing these programs, we often think of a heteronormative family unit. And uh, and even, you know, uh, even if that isn't the reality of the of the kind of parenting and the kind of family units that we encounter on the ground. So uh, it's always not not just from a from a gender diversity point of view, but also from a from a, a, a biological two biological parents alive cohabiting uh, in a in a marriage or a, or, a, or a union is the sort of programming that we often aim towards and the sort of target audience that we sort of envisage. Wherein, in actual fact, if you look at census data, particularly in Southern Africa, but also in across the world, we find that the vast majority of times we're not actually aiming to that that's not the reality on the ground that that uh you know in Eswatini one in five children grow up in that environment with a, a biological two biological parents cohabiting under the same roof and so how do we change our, our our parenting programming and our our approach to this now to consider the you know the the multi uh, faceted uh, ways in which uh, children are brought up and in which parent parents parent essentially thanks thank you so much and yella in about half a minute sure i think um one last thing i could also add to contribute to this conversation is the need to also engage men on the on the policy and decision maker level as well so not just as beneficiaries of programs or in communities but also make decision makers male decision makers advance this agenda, the advocate for the redistribution and, and, and recognition of care work, and also seed space for the participation of women and other <clears throat> and other traditionally excluded groups in these spaces, in these key forums. Thank you so much, my panelists, uh, Yela, Thomas, and Godfrey. I think this is an area that we are just beginning going to learn, and we need to see how to make it effective and take it scale. So I'm going to invite Courtney to wrap up this webinar. Courtney. Thanks, Peter. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to start by just thanking all the speakers today. It's been such a pleasure for uh, me for this webinar to mostly be listening and absorbing all this wonderful dialogue and, and the information shared. So yeah, thank you to Tavishi, to the team at Equimundo who worked with her, to Ramadan, Godfrey, Yara, and Tom um, for their time. And of course, all of the METF co-chairs and the team who works on, on this group who organize this webinar. So I think before folks drop off, I'm going to launch the closing poll. Maybe Marcella, you can launch that now, and we'll give you all a minute to just respond to a few questions before I move to a couple of closing slides with some information from our group. Let's see. I can. Oh, great. Perfect. So I think you should all have that popped up in your Zoom screens now. So there are just two questions with a few answer options. So the first question is just, you know, how did you think today's presentation influenced you and your perception of caregiving within your work? And then, you know, just revisiting our objective for the webinar. So we wanted to examine the obstacles or barriers, but also facilitators to men's role and participation in caregiving um, and share some of the recent research and programming that folks are doing. How well do you think we, we did today in meeting that objective? So I'll give you all a moment, wait for a, a critical mass to respond.
maybe just a couple more seconds. There's a, about a third of us have, have responded, which is a, a pretty good showing so far, considering where we're at today. Um, we'll give it 30 more seconds and we can close and just share out quickly on the poll and then I'll move to close us today. All right, so um, I should be sharing the results now. So it looks like a lot of folks said that, you know, from what was shared today, there's some excitement around visiting the websites of the organizations you presented, which is great. Definitely our intention at all times to highlight others' wonderful work. Um, and that the presentations are providing kind of new context for integrating caregiving into our work. So some new ideas are coming out today. Um, and then we've, we've somewhat or completely met these objectives, uh, mostly a positive showing on, on the fact that what we covered today was, was on track on what we intended to do. So that's great. Let me stop sharing and let me, let me move us to close. So if you go to the next slide, just a reminder here, you know, Dominic mentioned what the, the male engagement task force is, but just a reminder, we, we are part of the interagency gender working group, right? So this is a network of, of practitioners, NGOs. Uh, within the USAID sphere and, and really primarily in global health who gather to, to address gender equity within our health areas. Um, so, so I'm gonna direct you to the website for IGWG where you'll find a lot of different resources and a, and a pool of tools and, and readings, but, but also just a reminder that the recording for this webinar and other webinars, as well as the resources that we shared, so slide decks and the links that we shared will be available on that website. And, and they will be sent to everyone who registered and joined us today too. Um, and then just on the next slide, Dominic also mentioned that in terms of the male engagement task force, we have our own page there. If you're looking for resources on male engagement, that's where you can go. If you want to network with us. If you want to share your own work as well, come, come and let us know. So join us on that page. And, and he mentioned that we have a Google group and that, that's an email. I believe it's sent out you know, a, a newsletter format sent out every two weeks or, or, or twice or three times a month. So we're always looking for resources that we can highlight and share. So if you join that group, um, which the link has just been sent by Kendra in the chat, we'd love to, to share your work out with us and be able to potentially engage you in our upcoming work. So from our group, you'll, you'll, you'll see requests to join two webinars around two webinars a year. And we also produce a, a knowledge product and, and that's gonna be coming out in the next few months. And we're really excited to share that with you all. So I think that's it for me. Um, thanks again for joining and sticking with us. And thank you again to all the organizers and speakers. Have a great day or evening ahead. <laughs>